my name is Jamie. Uh, my talk is based on a blog post that I wrote um, several months ago. The blog post is here. Um, it contains slightly different, uh, more information, let's say. This is slightly stripped down, slightly reworked. Um, so the talk is based on observations um, that I think I've, I've, I've made, trends I think I've seen in the industry in the last couple of years. Um, it's titled, Did Virtualization Create DevOps? And Will Containerization Destroy It? OK, um, I'm interested in the change that I've seen. I've, I think I've seen um, sort of cause and effect in certain uh, places. And with that in mind, I'm interested in this definition of potential energy. Um, in physics, potential energy is the energy that an object has due to its position or the configuration of its parts. So um, hands up anyone who had a feature phone a little bit like this um, many years ago. So what, what were you running on that? Was that um, was iOS? Was it Android 5, 4, 3? <laughs> So what, first observation is, it's very simple. Changes in hardware um, create potential for change in software. And we've all seen the, the rapid um, change within the mobile uh, technology world. And hands up, anyone who knows the name of their bank manager? Not a single person, me neither. Bank manager. Yeah. So changes in software, advances in software, such as um, operating systems, apps, web services, they, they give us options, they give us uh, choice, and that empowers us to do things differently. So we have advances in software which are creating potential change in people. Uh, we, we choose to, to bank online. So in the 90s, uh, server hardware, generally speaking, very little processing power, very little memory. Um, as a consequence of that, we would have a lot of servers. And we'd probably have quite a lot of uh, ops people to look after those servers. This is my ops character, by the way. Um, we also had, well, servers were, relatively speaking, very expensive. So we installed as much as we could on one server to get our money's worth, risk allowing. Uh, this resulted in having a pretty complex server stack. It meant that we had a long time, it took a long time to build or to rebuild the server. And the, this meant that our focus was on mean time bet uh, between failure because we wanted to make sure that that was a long period. We had a good mean time between failure. That resulted in a fear of breakage. And you know, uh, we um, as ops were very defensive about anyone else touching the servers. As a result of that, devs didn't really get a chance to have a relationship, get familiar with the servers. And in the 2000s, we see a lot of advances in hardware. We start to get servers which are extremely powerful, more powerful than you need to, to run a single um, application stack <laughs> on, on a single server, maybe with the exception of, of databases. And the, this, this change in this advance in hardware creates the potential for change within software. And we see virtualization arrive. Um, hypervisors appear, which allow us to virtualize. So if we look at the, the stack on the, on the left, this is a more traditional hardware uh, bare metal stack. There's a one-to-one -one relationship between the server hardware and the operating system. But if we look at the one on the right, where we've introduced the hypervisor and we've done virtualization, we have created, we've abstracted the layer between the server hardware and the operating system. And we've broken that one-to-one -one relationship. We've got a one-to-many relationship um, with many operating systems as virtual machines on one piece of hardware. Now you can get, you know, I'm sure people who've worked in this area, you've seen tens or even hundreds of virtual machines on a piece of a um, single server. Um, this creates a problem. This problem is about managing many systems. 
So the solution to this problem is in software. The solution is configuration management. Um, and this change in software, this advancement in software, uh, creates potential change within people. In this case, uh, devs. The configuration management provides a familiarity in the in language construct because we are now able to provide a tool to, to people outside of the ops um, world to build these servers. And the tool uses constructs language uh, which describe the code, or sorry, the, the code that is used describes the infrastructure in a way that uh, developers were, were more familiar with. Also, the option to manage uh, servers via web console was different to having to go and ask someone to, to spin you up a server. So you now have an interface. So this empowered developers, and they began to get a closer relationship with, the, with servers. So if we look at the areas of responsibility, um, ops, sorry, this is a, uh, our stack here with a hypervisor, and then just a single VM here. Um, ops have got responsibility for server hardware, for the hypervisor, for the operating system. Uh, devs have responsibility for the application layer. Um, if we bring in our solution to the problem, we talked about the configuration management tools. We see that the configuration management starts uh, just above the base operating system install. It adds in extra operating system packages, and then it uh, builds the application on top of that. But what we've got here with the uh, using configuration management with both operations and devs having a stake in using configuration management to build, we've created this gray area. And in this gray area, it's not obvious who owns it. They're both stakeholders of this gray area. So the ops guys, they, they, need, they need these extra operating system packages for, for NTP, for monitoring clients, for uh, user accounts, things like that. The dev guys, they need extra operating system packages for uh, libraries for their application, for say Python libraries for a Java install. So it turns out that the best way to, to solve this problem, to divide this, this area between the two stakeholders, is to get them to work together. And so as, as crude a definition as this is, we have a viable DevOps scenario. This, I didn't mention, is obviously my little dev character. So um, in the 2010s, the 2010s, um, software advances, and we see containerization arrive. Uh, we see Docker leading the charge. We see Rocket um, sort of coming along as well. And we see sort of more work with LXC and LXD. So if we look again at the, at the breakdown here, We have, on the left, um, without any containerization, a one-to-one -one relationship between the operating system and the application level. On the right, with the container platform in place, we have, again, created an abstraction between the operating system and the application layer. We've broken the one-to-one -one relationship, and we've got a one-to-many relationship between the operating system and the application layer. And we have, again, created a problem of managing many app containers. So the solution to this problem um, lies in software. Um, it's container management and it's container build tools. The advance in software um, can create potential change in people. So I wonder what the consequences are for the people who now have more tools and more choices. So if we look on the left, we can see areas of responsibility. We can see that the, uh, we can see the gray area that we defined earlier, where both the devs and ops have a shared area of responsibility. On the right, we can see the sort of same stack with the container platform inserted. Notice that the extra OS packages that the app needs are sitting above the container platform because if you want to run the same application uh, 
with different versions of the same operating system package. You want to get that operating system package up into the application container. So it's sitting, it's sitting up there as part of the container. Then next we've got the, contain, the container platform. Uh, this is actually part of the extra operating system packages for the base OS. Obviously we can't put a container, an app container up there without the container platform um, installed. And so it has to go on there at that stage. So we introduced our, our tools. We can see that the configuration management uh, tool on the left here starts ab above the base OS, builds the extra oper operating system packages, and builds the app layer on the right. Similar start uh, above the base OS, extra operating system packages, including the container platform. But then the container management and the build tools, they take over. They've been added in, and they're taking responsibility for building the containers. Now, note something. The gray area that we have on the left is gone. So if we look at areas of ownership, where each of these two groups might, might claim their stakes, there isn't any significant overlap in comparison. So advances in software, the containerization that has come along, actually has created a clearer border between the app logic and the system logic. And so advances in software, how will that affect how the potential change within people? Well, our devs and our ops, it may be that they're given mutually exclusive areas of ownership. So I wonder. If the gray area that we've defined is gone, that kind of brought people together, is the imperative for dev and ops to work closely together also gone? Thanks.